Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for attending the webinar, the Sports Medicine Australia Sports Concussion Community Education Forum. Um, I'm Dr. Andrew Gardner. I am a clinical neuropsychologist from the University of Newcastle and also the co-director of the Hunter New England Local Health District Sports Concussion Clinic. Uh, I've been studying, uh, researching and studying sports related concussion and working clinically in the field for about 15 years. Uh, so it's great to have you all on board and thanks for coming to um, go through the education seminar. Now Sports Medicine Australia and myself have been delivering the workshops um, all over New South Wales. So this is an opportunity for everybody nationwide to see what uh, the workshop that I've been delivering uh, as part of the Sports Medicine Australia education program. and. Working face-to-face -face is a lot easier in terms of getting people to uh, ask questions while the presentation is on and also to uh, chat to, to me about things that are brought up on the slides. Uh, as a webinar, it's a little bit more challenging to do that. However, I would encourage people to send through questions. If anything comes up on the slide or I've said something that you do want to ask a question about, by all means use the chat uh, uh, option down on the left-hand side of your screen uh, and those questions will come through to me. Uh, most of the time I will be able to answer those straight away, uh, but if not and I miss any, then right at the end of the session we can we can have a discussion about that as well and talk it through. I'm just going to shut down the webcam now and we'll start going through the presentation. I'll bring the webcam back up again right at the end of the session. Just having difficulty going through the slide, there we go. So uh, the sports concussion policy was created uh, by a few experts and I'll go through and give credit where credit's due with that on the next slide. Uh, but we work together uh, with Sports Medicine Australia in partnership with the New South Wales Office of Sport to put together a, a sports concussion policy that was launched in February this year at the New South Wales Institute of Sport and it was in partnership as I said with the New South Wales Office of Sport. The people that were involved were Dr David Hughes who is the Chief Medical Officer of the Australian Institute of Sport. Dr. Paul Bloomfield, who's the Chief Medical Officer of the National Rugby League, Dr. Warren McDonald, who's the Chief Medical Officer of Rugby Australia, and Dr. Alex, Alex Donaldson, who's from La Trobe University and is an implementation scientist, and then also myself. In terms of the overview of this presentation, we're going to be talking about a concussion definition. We'll also talk about prevalence rates in various sports. We'll talk about signs and symptoms, recognition and management, return to activities and return to play, and then just a comment on the potential longer term issues. So by the time you finish going through this webinar, hopefully you'll understand what a concussion is if you don't already. You'll also understand common causes of concussion. You'll understand what common signs and symptoms of concussion are and be able to identify those hopefully. The management of suspected concussion or head injury, returning to life, return to learn, return to school and university and also returning to the sporting field and the processes that we need to go through seeking medical clearance to uh, get them to re uh, the athlete to return to play. And we'll also talk a little bit very briefly about sports specific policies. One of the things or one of the hats that I also wear is the uh, concussion consultant to Rugby Australia. So a lot of the information that I give is um, rugby league and rugby union slightly biased. Um, so I, I'll apologise for that up front for those who are involved in other sports. A lot of the information that I've presented in this uh, presentation as well is very general, so you need to think specifically about the sports in which you may be involved in and how some of the general information applies specifically to those sports. So let's start with a definition. Any disturbance of normal brain function, whether that's mild or subtle like seeing stars, or a more obvious injury like having balance problems or a perceived loss of consciousness, meets criteria for a definition or definitional criteria for sports related concussion. So some of the signs and symptoms may be covert, so you can't see them yourself, so you're relying on the athlete reporting that change, that subtle change uh, in their normal brain functioning. Uh, but then the obvious signs you should be able to see and detect. When we talk about sports-related concussion, we're referring to a functional disturbance rather than a structural brain injury. So if we had an athlete sustain a concussion and we put them in a MRI scanner or a CT scanner and we're looking at structural images, most of the time we're not going to see anything. And if we do see something, then we're not talking about a sports related concussion. We're more than likely talking about a complicated mild traumatic brain injury. Now, when we talk about uh, the brain, it is a very intricate and very complex structure. Communication between different brain areas occurs through chemicals, through electrical currents, 
And so when a impulsive force goes into the head, whether it be through a direct blow or a blow elsewhere and transmitted to the head, that can lead to disruption in the chemical and electrical communication and activities. Now concussions can occur in many different ways and the athlete can have different signs and symptoms. So that's why no concussion typically presents the same. Now if you've been involved in contact or collision sports or combat sports or been around sport long enough and you've seen enough athletes who have had concussions, you'll appreciate that most of the time they're not presenting exactly the same. They have a different constellation of symptoms and even athletes who have multiple concussions present slightly differently each time. It's not as easy as managing, say, a broken bone where we know that we need to have it in a cast for six to eight weeks and then we rehabilitate to get the strength back and then we get them back on the field. Concussion is completely different. We don't know how to make a very good prognosis and it's really a matter of managing the signs and symptoms. So concussion is uh, a significant and complex health issue and all concussions need to be managed appropriately. So if you see subtle signs and that meets criteria for you to recognise that a concussion may have occurred, you're removing that athlete from play and referring to a medical practitioner. So you'll find that we go th as we go through the slides, recognise or recognition, removal and refer are the three R's that I'm going to be really reinforcing with you this evening. So we need to be able to recognise that an injury occurred before we're able to do any kind of management process and it is important that we remove that athlete from play immediately and we're referring to a medical practitioner. As I said, not all concussions are the same, which means that an individualised management strategy is required for every concussion. Now, if we have a look at some of the prevalence rates, and this is US data, so you need to think in terms of the uh, population in the US compared to the population here. But they're dealing with 1.6 to 3.8 million concussions that are reported to team doctors annually. And we believe that this is an underestimation. Uh, as many of you probably know yourself, athletes don't tend to want to report concussions. They want to stay on the field. They don't want to let their team down. They might be playing in an important game. Uh, there's lots of reasons why an athlete might try to deny that they're experiencing a concussion. And so it's thought that these rates are about six to ten times greater. When we have a look at certain sports, uh, you can have a look here that horse racing is a high risk of, or a higher risk or higher prevalence rate of uh, concussion than many other sports. When we think about horse racing though, we're thinking about a sport that where people are moving along very fast, they're falling from a great height, and then they have the risk of other very heavy horses uh, landing on top of them or, or stepping on them. And so most of the time, even though the information is presented here as a sports concussion prevalence rates, uh, most of the time when a jockey unfortunately comes off a horse, they're sustaining a much more severe injury than a sports related concussion. Now if we have a look at the next tier, uh, we've got the sport of boxing, which uh, the objective is to, is to punch the opposition in the head and to try and um, render them unconscious. So you can appreciate that if that's the objective of the sport, that concussion rates are going to be pretty high. And if we have a look down at the next section where there's uh, highlighted in orange, you can see that our three uh, popular collision sports codes, uh, Australian Rules Football and Rugby League and Rugby Union, have reasonably high prevalence rates. And then we gradually go down. You can see in American football that it's uh, 0.9. Now, a lot of the attention in the media and a lot of the attention with um, funding and a lot of research is focused on American football. But if you have a look at our sports, they're three to four times greater in terms of the prevalence rates that are reported and the sport that gets a lot of the attention. All right, so we're going to go through recognize, remove, and refer. Now, I don't want people to confuse recognition uh, to, with diagnosis. It's not our job as non-medical practitioners to make a diagnosis. What it is is uh, an ability to recognize that a concussion may have occurred, and then we're removing that athlete from play. Now, if we're looking at loss of consciousness and post-traumatic amnesia, which are typically used as measures uh, of the severity of a traumatic brain injury, we're going to miss the large majority of sports-related concussions. So as you can see there, loss of consciousness occurs in less than 10%. Post-traumatic amnesia occurs in approximately 20%. So many of the signs and symptoms, as I've said before, are often covert, so we don't actually see them. It's the athlete reporting them to us. And so the in-match recognition of concussion can be quite challenging. Let's see if I can get this video to play for us. Doesn't look like it's going to play, unfortunately. So 
You can see that the defender there, Brisbane Broncos player, has his head in front of the hip of the ball carrier. If I played that video through, he does take a little glancing blow and falls out the back of the tackle. He then stands up and runs back to the defensive line, tripping over one of his player's uh, legs. Then he runs back further towards the defensive line, turns around and falls down. Now, when I've given this presentation face-to-face -to, -face to uh, people that have attended, um, I've always asked them, does that meet criteria for recognising that a concussion may have occurred? And about 50% of the people on most of the presentations put their hand up and 50% of the people either choose not to put their hand up or, or, or think that it's not a concussion. Now, what I typically say then is that this is an elite level athlete who has run backwards multiple times during his career at training and in games and has never fallen over. They're playing on a very, very good surface, so he hasn't sat, uh, stood in a hole and rolled his ankle and fallen down because of that. We have seen that there is a bump that occurred just before uh, he's had that um, gait issues or balance issues. And so it's highly likely that that athlete has sustained a concussion, so we're removing that player from play. Uh, at the elite level, there is the opportunity for them to be assessed and returned to play. However, in this circumstance, uh, the athlete was not returned to play. He was diagnosed with a concussion. Now, we, we don't work at the elite level, so we don't have, or, or I apologise if there are people from the elite level here, um, but if I'm talking about the community level where the large majority of participants occur and we're looking after amateur athletes or semi-professional athletes, there's no opportunity for us to do an assessment or a medical practitioner to do an assessment and return an athlete to play. What we need to do is to recognise, and if we have any doubt whatsoever that an athlete may have sustained a concussion, we're, we're sitting them out. So if in doubt, sit them out. Now, concussions can occur as a result of impact with another player, whether that be an opponent or a teammate. For those who have seen a lot of National Rugby League games um, over the last couple of seasons, um, sometimes you'll see a, a, a player make a hit up uh, and then two players, two defenders come and make a tackle and their heads go around behind that player and run into each other or clash, they clash heads. That's been happening a little bit in the National Rugby League. Uh, so you can still get hit by a friendly fire and, and sustain a concussion. Concussions can also occur as a result of hitting the playing surface. It can also occur as hit, uh, from hitting equipment, whether that be the ball or a puck or a um, goal post, for example. So contact causing a concussion can occur in possession of the ball or contesting the ball. So if you think about in Australian rules football, a um, 360 degree sport where you can get hit from, from any angle. If you're contesting for a ball and you get your head down over the ball, you may get a bump, whether it be from the opposition's hip or their, their head getting down over the ball as well. Uh, but it can also occur in back play or an off-the-ball off the, off the ball incident. So we need to be aware that we're not just following the ball when we're watching games or when we're on the sideline responsible for identifying concussions, that we're having a look in back play as well. Now, the National Rugby League, there's been some um, conjecture about uh, late shots on players over the last couple of weeks. Uh, and this is a, a bit of an issue in terms of whiplash-type injuries that can occur. So if a player has passed a ball and has relaxed, their neck muscles are not prepared or, or none of their muscles are really prepared for an impact. And if they get hit in the middle of the back, um, then their head gets, uh, gets that whiplash type motion and it is a susceptibility to potentially having a concussion. All right, it's also important to recognise that concussions can occur from legal play and they can also occur from illegal play. So just because the play is legal, doesn't necessarily mean that a, a concussion hasn't occurred. And just because the play is illegal doesn't mean that a concussion has occurred either. However, if you're playing a sport where contact to the head is illegal and your team is wins a penalty, if that's a, the, the best description, or if the opposition hit one of your players um, high and are penalised for that contact, then that's an indication that you may like to go or may want to go onto the field and check out that player and make sure that they're okay. So, um, you see a question came through, is that ice hockey? Um, yep, it is ice hockey. So uh, in North America, they call hockey hockey and we call, we call it field hockey. So thanks for clarifying that for everybody. Yes, that's, uh, that was ice hockey statistics, not field hockey statistics. All right, um, so concussions can also occur in training. So we need to be aware that if we're looking after all of our athletes in game play and we have all the mechanisms in place to make sure that we're identifying it, we're recognising, we're removing, but we're not doing anything at training or we're just relying on the coach to, to make that recognition, we need to be aware that concussions do occur in any kind of contact session. There is some degree of risk and so we need to be able to identify, recognise, remove and refer from training sessions as well. As I've mentioned, but I'll say it uh, 
directly. Contact does not need to be made directly to the head. So you can get the whiplash type injuries, you can get trans, uh, the mechanical forces transmitted up through, through the neck and into the head where there's no contact made to the head at all. So concussions can occur through that mechanism. Now, here's some obvious signs uh, to recognise or that a concussion may have occurred in one of your athletes. Any kind of loss of consciousness or non-responsiveness. Lying on the ground or slow to get up. Now, you need to put that in the context of your sport. If we're talking about rugby league and rugby union uh, and a player has um, laid down and is not getting up because they don't want to be penalised because they're either at the side of the ruck or in the ruck or they're just rolling over so that they, they don't get uh, interfere with play and be penalised. I'm not referring to those situations. But if the play moves on and that player still hasn't moved and they're slow to get up, then there's a potential that they may have sustained a concussion. They may have sustained another injury and might be lying down because of that reason as well, but there is a potential that they may have and it's worth going on and asking them about that. Now, if an athlete doesn't brace themselves for the fall uh, and they make contact with the playing surface, they don't put their arms out, then it's highly likely they've lost consciousness and that they have uh, sustained a concussion. You would have seen uh, one of those injuries recently if you were watching uh, the NRL. Now, unsteadiness on feet, balance problems, poor coordination, these are all indicators that somebody sustained a concussion. Grabbing or clutching or shaking the head, again, we need to put that in the context. I'm not talking about a game where there's a lot of rain around and they're wiping mud or water off their head or it's a really hot day and they're wiping sweat off their brow. I'm talking about somebody looking a little bit agitated or, or a little bit distressed and uh, shaking their fuzziness out of their head or, or grabbing their head. Now the next one, dazed, blank or vacant look. Now you need to be aware of your athletes. Some athletes potentially look like that before they get any kind of knock. Um, so you need to be aware of what your athlete looks like, what their normal behaviour is, and so any kind of subtle changes from that normal normal look or normal behaviour needs to be identified and you recognise that, you remove the athlete from the way and referral to a medical practitioner. Any kind of obvious facial or head wound or injury doesn't necessarily mean that every laceration you have that you're looking after is a concussion. But there's a good indication that something happened where there was a blow to the head and if it's caused a laceration you need to be asking those questions. So it's just a little bit of an identifier that you may want to ask some questions about whether they've sustained a concussion. Now in terms of the athletes themselves, if they're unaware of what happened, even if it is for a few moments, then it's highly likely they've sustained a concussion. Disorientation, but again we need to know our athletes well and for those who are looking after kids who are playing at an away ground that they've never played at before, um, and it's their first year playing the sport and you're asking them uh, where are you, that's a bit of an unfair question. So we need to be um, aware of, of pitching our questions at the right level so that we're getting a good idea uh, of, of the athlete's ability. For getting routine team plays, if you're a part of a structured sport and the athlete has been training with the team for um, all pre-season and, and they might have been playing for a few weeks already, the season's already started, and they're forgetting the routine team plays when that's not normally like them, then that's a good indication that something's happened. Any kind of memory lapses, forgetting any portions of the game or the score or how they arrived at the ground, uh, that's an indication that a concussion may have occurred. Uh, again, you need to put it in the context. If you're, if you're a cricketer and you're out there batting for a few hours and you get a, a bouncer to the head um, and you go out and ask the, the um, the batsman, what the score is, it's a bit unfair if they don't have a scoreboard around to actually know exactly what the score is. So you just need to put all that in context. Feeling slowed down, now that can be in mental processing, so whether you're um, making decisions mentally uh, or also in your physical movement, so um, feeling like you the, the game's moving faster than you're able to keep up with it. And then the athlete repeating themselves. I'm sure, I'm sure those who uh, are here who have looked after athletes who have sustained concussions have asked you multiple times, uh, did we win, did we win, did we win? Um, and so that's one uh, pretty obvious sign that, that something's occurred. Um, highly likely that it's a concussion. They might be in a little bit of post-traumatic amnesia where they can't lay down new memories. So when you give the answer, they don't remember what it is and they don't even remember asking the question and that's why they're repeating themselves. Now this slide is just an example of the common signs and symptoms that you may see post-concussion. Now the, the, the reason why I put this in the presentation is that because these signs, although they're common to sports related concussion, they're not specific to sports related concussion and so somebody in the general population can experience one or many more of these signs for any other reason aside from concussion. So we typically put them into categories so you can see that physical, cognitive, emotional and sleep. On game day you're not going to know anything about sleep because they haven't had a sleep yet. 
but some of the other things you may see or they may be reporting to you. Now, as I said, it's not necessarily specific to concussion, but they are common. Uh, they do occur commonly after a concussion. If I've had a really bad sleep, I might wake up and, and I feel um, fatigued, certainly. I might be sensitive to light or noise. I might have a headache and I'm just feeling nauseous because I haven't had enough sleep. Now, there's three or four or five signs that I've got already um, that are part of these common signs that occur post-concussion, but I haven't had a concussion. It's, it's uh, because I'm, I'm uh, sleep deprived that I have those signs and symptoms. So just to put that into the context, I, I want you to leave here knowing that these are common, uh, that they commonly occur post-concussion. If you've seen a bump and people are reporting one or more of these, then it's likely that it may be related to the concussion. But then you also need to know your athletes well, as I've kept saying previously. <clears throat> if an athlete has, suffers from a, a mental health illness, for example, they may have a constellation of these symptoms that they're bringing to the game before they even start. So you just need to be aware of, of what people um, are experiencing when they're coming to the game. Uh, and that's a, a, an important point, I think. If, they're, if you're playing a winter sport and they're coming with a cold, then potentially they may or may not or shouldn't be playing, potentially. But they may be bringing a whole lot of those symptoms to the game before they even start. So we've identified that a, an athlete may have sustained a concussion, so we're suspecting a concussion. Remember, we don't need to make a diagnosis. So now we need to step into the management strategy. And I've consistently said to you that we're removing that athlete from play or training. The second point is that when um, they're not permitted to return to play or training on the same day. So once we've removed that athlete with a suspected concussion, again, we're not making the diagnosis, they are not permitted to return to play on the same day. The only caveat to that is if anybody's on here that works at the professional level, um, then you'll know the sport specific criteria uh, related to return to play on the same day. And this is another video of um, a high profile rugby league player from a few seasons ago. He plays with the Dragons now, so he's there in the Canterbury Bankstown um, colours. And he sustained a bit of a bump and he is, is a little bit dazed. Um, that's not what he usually looks like. Um, he has a little bit of uh, balance issues when he takes the step. But he, he's basically in this video shrugging the trainer off and saying, um, I'm, get, I'm going to stay on the field. Now this has um, a, a few points to make out of a video like this. Number one is that uh, when our young athletes, amateur athletes, are looking to our professional players um, and how they behave, this is not the greatest of educational points. However, if he had put his hand up and said, yep, I'm coming straight off, then if it's good enough for James Graham to do it on Friday night football, then it's good enough for little Johnny and little Mary to do it on Saturday morning in the under 13s, whatever sport. Now, the other point that I wanted to make out of this is that if James Graham says to the trainer, I've had lots of concussions before and I bounce back pretty well, if I get a concussion this game, I don't want you to take me from the field. I know what the risks are. I'm not going to um, complain about you later on. Um, everything's fine. If I get a concussion, just leave me out there. I tend to play pretty well even if I do sustain a concussion. So why is it that we would take that athlete off if he's already given his permission that he wants to stay out there and the coach wants him to stay out there? Most important thing is that it reduces the risk of a potential second injury. It enables a thorough assessment to be conducted and it maximises that athlete's potential recovery. Now, I don't know how many of you have heard of the, um, the term second impact syndrome. Some of you may have, some of you may have not. Now, second impact syndrome is a very, very rare condition, but I will tell you about it. It is believed to be a catastrophic consequence of an athlete sustaining a second concussion when they haven't recovered from their first concussion. So when I say catastrophic, I mean it's a fatality. Now, in the world literature, there are only about 95 cases that have been verified. There are a lot more cases that have been reported as second impact syndrome in the literature, but there's only about 95 that have been reported. Now, 95 is a lot, um, but when you put it in the context of the millions of athletes that have competed, uh, whether it be at school level, whether it be at club level, professional level, over the hundreds of years that injury medical injuries have been recorded, 95 is, is very, very small. So as I said, it's a rare disease or a rare illness or a rare condition. Now, of those 95, the large majority of those athletes have been American football players, males aged between 14 and 21. Um, now, that doesn't mean that the risk is more prevalent in those sports. Um, it just That's just the characterization of, of the, the verified cases. Now, we need to be aware that, yes, um, this can happen, but it's, um, it is very, very rare. What's most likely to happen 
is that if you get a second bump on top of your first bump and you haven't made a recovery, it's going to take you a lot longer to recover. The symptoms are highly likely to going to, to be exacerbated and you might get a whole new constellation of symptoms on top of the symptoms that you're already trying to recover from. So that's the main reason why we need to ensure that we're removing the athlete every single time. We don't want to make them make them um, at risk of, of getting that second bump. Uh, so question, is the second injury within a day? Yeah, it typically is within, within the, the same day. So that's the reason why we're asking people to remove them from play and they're not to return to play that same day. Um, I'm just reading another question here of traumatic amnesia. Um, I'll answer that question at the end. Uh, so we'll All right, so basically what I want you to take away from this slide is that we do need to be removing the athletes from play. We need to be protecting them from themselves. Sometimes they're, if they've got a concussion, they are uh, potentially disrupting the, the, the very organ that they're using to make decisions. Uh, and so sometimes they can't make very good decisions for themselves, so we need to be making those decisions for them and protecting them, removing them from play, making sure they're uh, not at risk of getting a second bump. We're referring to a medical practitioner to make the diagnosis and to manage them and then to uh, make a clearance for them to return to play. Now, in terms of the red flags where you need to call an ambulance immediately, if you see any of these signs, then it's highly likely that the athlete um, has something a little bit more serious going on uh, and we need to have that investigated to make sure that everything's being looked after. So any kind of neck pain um, or tenderness, double vision, weakness or tingling or burning down arms or legs, a severe or increasing headache, any kind of seizure or convulsion, any loss of consciousness, deteriorating consciousness, repetitive or repeated vomiting, increasing restlessness, agitation or aggression, particularly in those athletes who are not typically behaving like that. Now, symptoms tend to get better, not worse with time. So any deterioration or any increase in the severity of any symptom is a red flag and you need to be calling an ambulance. Now, examples that we've got on here are just repetitive vomiting, um, drifting in and out of consciousness or an increasingly severe headache. Now, if the athlete has been, uh, for want of a better word, cleared from your duty of care and sent home with a parent, sent home with a significant other, or you're at an away trip and you're driving the bus home and it's a couple of hours um, to, to get back to, to your home, home ground or your, your home turf. If an athlete experiences any of these things, you need to be uh, redirecting that bus straight to the emergency department or calling an ambulance to meet you wherever the bus is. So we need to be making sure that we're taking everything very seriously, um, that when we go on away trips, we're aware of where the hospitals are. Uh, we know what the mechanism is for calling an ambulance and where they need to go on the ground to get there in the quickest way, where the gates are that let them on the field, et cetera, et cetera. So that's just all part of the planning and organisation that should really be going on um, all the time. And if you're not sure at an away venue, then just asking the duty manager or whoever's on there of the ground uh, at the time when you are. Now, management of an unconscious player. So if an athlete is unconscious, they're not able to tell you if they can't feel their arms or legs or if they've got a burning sensation or a tingling sensation down their arms or legs or if they've got any kind of neck pain or neck tenderness. So what we need to do initially, uh, and the, the number one principle is really to look after the airway, so we should always apply the first aid principles, but it's extremely important that we also consider any unconscious player to also have a neck injury. We need to be treating that um, appropriately as well, uh, but the airway always takes precedence, so we need to be aware of that. Now, if you don't have neck safe training, then you shouldn't be attempting to do any kind of uh, stability or, or looking after the neck. You need to be finding somebody who, who does do that. But if the airway is compromised, um, then we need to be looking after the neck as best we can, but we need to be making sure that airway. So a, a player who's removed from an activity because of a suspected concussion shouldn't resume an act, any activity within the first 48 hours. Even if their symptoms have resolved, shouldn't resume an act, any activity within the first 48 hours, even if their symptoms have resolved or, or they appear to have made a recovery. Just because those symptoms are absent immediately after an incident, it's not a reliable indicator because signs and symptoms can emerge anywhere up to two days after the impact. And so we need to be aware of that. We need to be making sure that the athlete is not going back to any kind of activity that makes their symptoms worse or makes their symptoms come back or puts them at risk of another knock.
So um, I was just reading some of the things that have come through. I'll um, talk to uh, answer that question uh, later on as well. So athletes with suspected concussion should be immediately removed from participation, not left alone initially, at least for the first one to two hours, potentially a little bit longer. Now, we strongly recommend that you don't provide any kind of uh, prescription medication. Uh, so any kind of blood thinning medication, uh, any kind of um, pain relief, because if somebody has a headache and they rate that as a five or six out of 10, you give them pain relief and that drops down to a, a say a two or a three. They come back to you in half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour, and they say, oh, it's back up to a, a, a six or a seven. We don't know if it's not a 10 out of 10 and you've just masked the symptoms by producing or offering them the pain relief. Uh, and then as it uh, gradually wears off, it gets back up to the same same um, rating, but it could potentially be a whole lot worse. So we need to uh, allow the medical practitioners to be looking after that. Um, so if you've got any concern and you think that they do need pain relief, then you're potentially uh, met criteria for wanting to send them to the hospital or getting a GP after hours just to see them. We've got to make sure that we're not sending out uh, any of the athletes who have a suspected head injury or concussion um, home by themselves. We want to make sure that they're being monitored by somebody during sleep that evening. If they're old enough to drive a motor vehicle, we don't want them to be doing that. Uh, we don't want them to be consuming any alcohol and we want to refer them um, for a medical assessment. So in some cases, symptoms might be uh, delayed. So the onset of symptoms may be delayed. Um, some people have coined that as a, as a delayed concussion. Um, so an athlete may feel fine initially and during the game or even after the game, uh, but hours later they may be experiencing some uh, symptoms or feel much worse. And this can, this can also occur days later. You'd have to be pretty clever um, and, and pretty astute to be able to uh, say that the symptoms that they're experiencing a couple of days later probably were related to a bump during the game that you didn't necessarily notice and the athlete didn't notice themselves. But if that does occur, then you need to treat that uh, concussion the same way as you would have had you uh, recognised the concussion on the same day. So if they're turned back up to training through the week and they get all of these symptoms, then you need to be removing them from that activity. Uh, you're recognising, you're removing, you're referring to a medical practitioner. So all players with concussion or suspected concussion need to have a medical assessment by a registered medical doctor. If a doctor is not present at the event, the player should be referred to a local general practitioner or hospital emergency department. So the management of head injury is difficult for a non-medical personnel um, and following a head injury, it's not often clear if you're dealing with a concussion or a more severe uh, head injury. So therefore, all players with concussion or suspected concussion need to have an urgent medical assessment to ensure that somebody who um, is medically trained is providing that care uh, diagnosis. Um, just a few questions coming through hard and fast. Um, so uh, does that include paracetamol? Yes. It does include paracetamol. Um, if their headache is uh, sufficiently bad and you give them paracetamol, it's not really going to do anything um, to relieve that pain anyway, but um, we don't want to be masking symptoms at all. Is alcohol only about masking symptoms? No, it's not. So alcohol is a uh, another drug that gets swished around in the brain of a brain that's trying to recover from a metabolic cascade of injury. We don't want to be adding other chemicals to that um, to that recovery process. Uh, there's not a lot of research that's gone on about how much alcohol um, affects the recovery process, but I think um, we can assume, um, just, yeah, I guess just make an assumption that, that adding more uh, chemicals to the brain that's already um, having a, a, a chemical cascade of recovery uh, is not a good thing for it. All right, so recovery. Most concussions resolve completely without residual problems within 10 to 14 days. That's adults. Uh, for children, it typically takes a little bit longer than that. Uh, for a minority of athletes, though, the uh, symptoms uh, tend to be prolonged. Uh, and when it gets to about the three months or when it gets to the three month period, they meet criteria for what we call post concussion syndrome. When somebody meets criteria for post-concussion syndrome, it's really anybody's guess about how long it's going to take for them to actually have their symptoms um, resolve. When they get that far out and they're still symptomatic, it's highly unlikely that they've returned to normal uh, life. So if they're a student, they're probably struggling a little bit with their studies 
or they're working harder to get the same grades that they were receiving prior to their concussion, or if they're an adult and they haven't quite got back to work full time, or they're pushing themselves to go to work because they've run out of sick leave and they're really struggling along. We need to be very, very conscious of the mental health um, effects that that can have. Somebody having to work a whole lot harder to do very basic things that they found easy previously does have an effect on your uh, on your self confidence, on your self image, and also um, on your mental status. So we need to be aware that people may be going into um, depression, they may be having anxiety. We need to be looking out for those things and making sure a medical practitioner is um, the athlete is referred to a medical practitioner to help manage those things. As I said, children and adolescents can typically do take a little bit longer to recover than adults in general. So rest is strongly recommended in the first 24 hours immediately after the concussion, uh, so 24 to 48 hours, and then we recommend that you progressively get involved in more activity thereafter. Now I'll just uh, explain that a little bit further. So the first 24 to 48 hours, as we said before, symptoms can present. Um, it's highly unlikely that even if a person's had a, had a, a significant bump and do, doesn't have symptoms, that they've made a full recovery. We do know that there's a metabolic cascade that goes on that takes a little bit longer to recover. Um, now, when I say progressively involved in more activities thereafter, if they're still symptomatic after 48 hours, we really want to manage that athlete so that they're not involved in activities that make the symptoms that they're experiencing worse. But we don't want them to be sitting in a dark room doing nothing and making themselves feel bad because again that, that's going to lead to mental health difficulties and probably exacerbation of the symptoms that they're experiencing. Now when the recommendation first came out about rest um, from the Concussion in Sports group which uh, meets every four years, international group of experts that get together, um, initially it was to rest as much as you can, uh, primarily complete rest, uh, for as long as you can until the symptoms res resolve. So if symptoms go for three weeks, then you're asking somebody to complete, try to completely rest for three weeks. What they found was that that wasn't really of benefit, and it was around about after the two to three day period where people needed to get back reintegrated into their social context and reintegrated in some activities, as long as it wasn't making symptoms worse, um, that they believe is um, where the uh, most benefit comes from. All right, Hayden, uh, does rest for the first 48 hours mean for school students, no school or work, no physical activity? Yes, that does. Um, in a few slides time, we'll be going over that, but yes, it does, 48 hours of complete rest. We'll press on and have a look at that uh, in the next couple of slides. So returning to activity, including play. So the priority for me, particularly when I'm looking after athletes in the sports concussion clinic uh, in Newcastle, is to um, return the person to school, so return to learn, whether that be school or activity, even return to work. Um, and make sure their family life is back right again and they're basically functioning in normal everyday activity. Uh, that's the priority and then return to sport is, is the next one. Now most of the athletes that I see the priority is around the other way so it can be a bit of a challenge. Um, they're very keen to get back to sport before they get the rest of their life in, in on track so we, we go through that um, as we can. Alright so now um, return to play decision. Always a medical one, um, so it may or may not be aided by pre-season uh, information, so whether they've done cognitive testing, balance testing or symptom checklist. Uh, and what typically happens is that an athlete will be assessed post-injury and the difference between the performance at baseline and the performance post-injury uh, is typically attributed to the concussion. Now that's, um, that needs to be put into context, uh, so there are a lot of tests that you can do where if you do it more times you get much better at it, what we call practice effects. And so people need to be aware of reliable change indices, et cetera, et cetera. It's getting a little bit technical for, for this talk, but I just want to make you aware of it, that just because somebody scores 100, uh, say, uh, let's say the mean is 100, the standard deviation is 10, and pre-season baseline they score 100, so smack bang on the mean, and then post-testing they score 100, but most athletes improve by standard deviation and score 110, then that athlete really should have been at 110, and even though their score is exactly the same as their pre-season baseline, it should be interpreted as a deficit, or not a deficit, a, um, a, a less than ideal performance, which may be that they haven't made a full recovery from the concussion. So whatever test we, we use, we need to understand what the um, psychometric properties are, is the term that we use for that, and understanding how to interpret those results. Now return to play. Um, an athlete who, um, who is still symptomatic should never be returned to play. So that, uh, on the same day we're not returning athletes to play and certainly if they're still symptomatic 
whether it be weeks or months later, they shouldn't be involved in activities that potentially put them at risk for another bump. So that um, while they're symptomatic, it's highly likely they haven't made a full recovery. So it may result in uh, a further concussion. It could potentially make things worse, um, and it could be a prolonged recovery, like we've said before. It may also make them uh, or make them more at risk for other injuries as well. Now, rest and recovery. So this is directly from the Sports uh, Medicine Australia concussion policy, and what they're recommending is that um, a children or a child, which is defined as 12 years and under, should not return to contact or collision sport um, within 14 days of resolution of their symptoms. So what that means is that if an athlete, so it's not 14 days from their from their uh, impact or their concussion, it's 14 days from the resolution of their symptoms. So if they get a concussion, they're symptomatic for five days, then what this uh, policy recommends is that they shouldn't be returning until the 19th day after their injury. So they've got 14 days um, of no contact um, until they're back to full contact training and uh, return to play with a medical practitioner clearing them. Um, and as we said before, rest is recommended within that four, uh, 24 to 48 hours. Now, as I said before, complications are not common. However, the risk of complications is increased by allowing a player to go back to the field of play or to training before they've made a complete recovery. So it is essential that we recognise and keep those players out from training and match play until they've made a complete recovery and they've been cleared by a medical practitioner to return to sport. Now, we do need to be aware of um, sport-specific policies. So World Rugby and Rugby Australia have mandatory sit-down periods and, and those of you who are involved in, in rugby um, should be aware of those and aware of the blue card. Um, and then we go through a graduated return to play process and we should be aware of that as well. Okay, so I've got a question coming through to clarify the point that I was making. Does that mean game day there are 10% higher performance on testing? I didn't understand that point. Now, I was just arbitrarily talking to you about a score, talking about standard deviations and means. So there's there's not, that was just, numbers that I rattled off, I could have used any number, so I'm not saying that at all, 10%. What I am saying is that if you perform a test at baseline and then you do it without having sustained a concussion and you perform it again, it's highly likely you're going to get a better score because you've already done the test before and there's practice effects that go on. So if you do have an athlete that's sustained a concussion and you have baseline, just because they score exactly the same score that they scored when they did the, the baseline test at the beginning of the season, doesn't mean that they don't have some kind of deficit uh, from their concussion that they've sustained. I hope that helps clarify that question, but by all means, um, write another note if, that, if you don't understand that. It doesn't make sense still. Okay, um, so information about concussion policies and um, on governing body websites. So um, those who are involved in rugby, you've got World Rugby and Rugby Australia, you've got the National Rugby League uh, as a website as well and those are the links to those websites. Now, information about the concussion um, in sport policy. Uh, the Australian Institute of Sport put out a concussion in sport policy last year in conjunction with the AMA, so the Australian Medical Association. Um, Dr David Hughes was involved in that one as well. It's very similar to the Sports Medicine Australia one that's came, that came out earlier this year. Those are the links to both of those policies if you need to use them and want to reference them, or if you want to take them to your clubs and say, we don't have a concussion policy, we should be implementing this or whatever you want to do. The information is there at those links, so by all means, use those to go and check those out. Now, um, just briefly, Rugby Australia, um, rest and mandatory sit-out periods. For those who are adults, um, defined as 19 years and over, mandatory one-week sit-out, and then you go through a graduated return to play. For those athletes who are 18 years and under, there's a mandatory two-week sit-out before you go through a graduated return to play. And this is the graduated return to play. So. Some of you may know about this, some of you may have heard about this, some of you uh, may have never heard about it, and some of you may not know anything about it. So let me just go through it, and I apologise for those who do know a bit about it, but I'll just explain things and maybe you might learn something new or maybe you know everything. Um, so if you have a look up the top there, we say the first 24 to 48 hours, physical and mental rest, and then stage one is uh, activities that you want to remain symptom free. So what you'll see um, in stage one is that people may just be involved in very light walking because you don't want to provoke the symptoms if, if somebody is still symptomatic. Now, 
each of these stages, you can see stage one, two, three, four, five, and six down the side there. Each of these stages take a minimum of 24 hours to progress through. So if somebody sustained a concussion on the Saturday and they have a game due to play the following Saturday, you cannot get through these eight days minimum to return to play the following week. So if you've got through stage one, then you move 24 hours later to stage two, you move to 24 hours later to stage three and you're going fine. If you're looking after me and I get to stage four and you send me for a run around the oval at 75% of my maximum heart rate, I get two laps around, come back to you and I've got my, my headaches come back, I'm feeling lightheaded and dizzy, I feel a bit nauseous and I report those symptoms to you. What you need to do is to make me stop that activity. I need to have 24 hours of rest and then I re revert back to the previous stage, so that's stage three in that example. So if you have any kind of setback like that, you're adding 48 hours to the graduated return to play process. So any kind of setback, you need to have 24 hours rest and then step back to the previous level. Now, if you get to stage four and you've made it through that stage four, so you've done whatever activity that you've done at stage four, you need to then go and seek medical clearance, preferably from the same doctor that made the diagnosis initially, to be cleared to return to full contact training and then returning to full match play. Now, this typically uh, brings up a lot of questions. Um, and so, okay. um, yeah, so you do, you do need to get a, a medical certificate, yes, and it's important to record that and to put it in your notes. Um, so that's, that's important. Uh, if any other questions come up, just, just send them through. I'll continue on with the slides. All right, so what does physical rest look like? Uh, so in a practical sense, we're saying no sport, no weights training, no cardiovascular training. If it's a school student, they're not involved in practical PDHPE classes and no leisure activities like bike riding or skateboarding that puts you at an additional risk of a head injury or making your symptoms worse. So that's from a physical perspective. When we talk about a cognitive perspective, we are talking about time off school, time off university, time off work. We are talking about no homework, no reading. We're talking about reducing or limiting or hopefully no visually stimulating activities. Now it's all well and good for us to sit in our ivory tower and say um, no visually stimulating activities but in a practical sense that would be like amputating some teenagers, not letting them go on um, social media and check their status etc. And I know that in a practical sense it's going to be very difficult but what we do want to do is to limit that activity as much as possible. When the recovering brain is engaged in visually stimulating material it is making a lot of different areas of the brain very very active. And so it is limiting the ability of the brain to make a, uh, a full recovery as quickly as it can by spending so much time um, with visually stimulating activities. So if we do have a school student not turning up the school on Monday because they sustained a concussion on the Saturday, they've got 48 hours of rest, so they do next to nothing or nothing on Sunday, they do nothing on Monday. We don't want to leave them home and they sit on, the, on their phone and or in front of the television watching movies or watching television all day and surfing the internet and checking their social media status because they are stimulating their brain uh, a fair bit by uh, being involved in those visually stimulating activities. Now the other thing that we want to limit or to prevent is um, trips outside of the home um, and, and people coming to visit and if the athlete feels sleepy or they need to rest then by all means um, they should do that as well. All right, one of the things that is new um, from this policy that has been recommended is a designated concussion uh, coordinator. Now this person doesn't need to be an expert, um, they don't need to um, have any kind of credentials, they just probably need to be reasonably good uh, with administration work. Now the person um, may be involved in an event or may be involved at the club and what their uh, main roles are, uh, what we're recommending the main roles are is to ensure that all stakeholders are aware of the concussion policy that's in, involved in the event or, or at the club or within the sport. That they coordinate all concussion education activities if, if that's a way they want to go. That they August, organise and distribute concussion resources. Um, they ensure all stakeholders follow the game day and, um, and training protocols. They notify parents of concussion players in junior rugby league as quickly as possible. Provide, um, uh, further advice about the management of their child, as in who to go and see, not advice as in they're giving medical advice. Uh, ensure that a concussed player um, follows the appropriate protocols, they've gone and got the medical diagnosis, they get the medical assessment to resume participation and you have evidence of that. And they identify and liaise with networks of local um, medical practitioners so that they can provide the names of those uh, to, the, to the team. 
So just a, a quick uh, comment about the long-term consequences. The simple answer really is at this stage we don't know. Um, what I will say to everybody is headlines travel fast, science takes time. So the media is not held accountable to any kind of scientific um, merit to anything that they say. Their job is to sell papers and to get attention and create clickbait. So there is a lot of good work that's going on in the, in the world and, and we are at a stage where we're making good progress. Um, but at this point in time, we, we don't have all of the answers and we don't have all of the answers that the media say that we have. And so it's probably going to take a generation of players before we can come up with this with the cause and effect relationship um, as to the long-term consequences. Um, however, we do have a lot of um, a lot of researchers around the world, particularly um, out of Boston, um, who are doing some some really good work. Um, so they're uh, making progress and helping us understand a lot of things um, that we didn't previously necessarily know quite as well as what we do now. Um, but it is still the early stages, uh, and so there's a lot more work to do. And they're one group that's that's doing doing a lot of work, and then there's other groups around the world that are also doing a lot of work, um, including here in Australia. Now, some of the common questions and comments that I get after I've delivered this presentation is a question about headgear. At the common questions and comments that I get after I've delivered this presentation is a question about headgear. At this stage, for concussion. There's no headgear on the market that will prevent concussion. So if you're advising your families or, or players to go out and buy headgear because it's going to protect you from concussion, um, then you're going to be a little bit disappointed because there's nothing on the market that can do that at this point in time. However, I'm not saying that headgear is no good because it certainly can do a good job in terms of um, protecting from lacerations, um, skull fracture, uh, cauliflower ear, for example, as well. So those are the kind of things that it does do a good job on, but but not, not concussion. Now, the other thing that we need to be aware of is that some of our athletes play multiple sports and or they are involved in school sport. And so the communication between schools and clubs is not good because the schools aren't able to communicate because of the uh, various privacy laws that go on. So what you need to do is to have a really good relationship with uh, the parents and make sure that the communication lines are open between you and the parents and if there's school teachers here, the school teachers, the parents, the parents and the club. So that if somebody sustains a concussion in school sport on a Thursday afternoon and they turn up to training that afternoon, the club knows that they shouldn't be allowing that athlete to participate. So we need to be very, very um, aware of what our athletes are doing outside of our sport um, and, and just making sure that, uh, what's going on. The other thing that I would um, point out to you and, and strongly encourage you all to do is to make sure you document everything. So any kind of advice, any kind of information that you provide for any kind of um, any athlete, um, who you spoke to, what you said, the recommendations that you gave, um, I would make sure you're documenting everything and you, you, you keep that document. So um, that concludes the presentation. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, and so what um, what I would say is if you've got any questions, by all means, um, pass it through. So Dr. Cohen has said research on NPRO headgear shows you, uh, the University of Ulster evidence for decreasing the force transmitted to the headgear in static models and clinical trials. Yep, but they're not available um, on the market just yet as far as I'm aware. Um, and yes, there are people that are working on it, not only that group, but a number of others as well. And it is showing promising signs. Uh, but in general, um, I think you'd agree, Dr. Cohen, that uh, that headgear in general uh, not, not, not really up to scratch just at this point in time. Uh, is it possible to get the slides? Yep, that's no problem. I can um, put a PDF together and, and pass that on to you. Is there a good stat test to these slides? Thank you. Uh, so what I, if I understand the question correctly, Jody, what I would say about the SCAT is that um, if you're not a medical practitioner, it was never created for you to use it. So um, really, again, if we're using tools that we don't know how to interpret it, it's very, very difficult as well. And I'm not saying that you don't know how to, but just a general comment uh, is that if you if you do administer a scat um, and the athlete at say at baseline gets um, 30 out of 30 on the immediate recall and then on their delayed recall they get 8 out of 10, then they sustain a concussion and you do a post injury assessment and they get 30 out of 30 but they get 6 out of 10. What does that actually mean? And nobody can provide an answer around the world because we have to look at the psychometric 
values and how many people would lose two um, points on their badge for that. So it's, um, it is something that needs to be researched much further. It is only a tool that's used to help guide a medical um, practitioner making a diagnosis or making an assessment. It's not a diagnostic tool and so we need to be very aware of that. Um, questions are coming thick and fast. I'm struggling to keep up. Uh, let me look. Okay. So what standard medical clearance is required? I have reviewed some. Yep. So it is it is challenging, uh, particularly in areas where resources are, are, are short. Um, we do rely on the GPs um, doing the best job that they can. Um, to the GPs' defence, they do need to know a lot about a lot of stuff and they don't necessarily know about the concussion policy of every single sport. Um, but what these sports, the governing bodies of the sports have been doing is trying to make sure that paperwork gets sent with uh, the athlete um, and that that paperwork needs to be signed off by the medical practitioner. So that if they don't know too much about the policy, they can click on the links on that paperwork and make sure that they're, they're doing the, the so-called right thing. Um, so yes, you may find that some general practitioners are seeking information from the athlete themselves when they're sitting there in front of them, but there might also be some that are better well aware of what's going on. A bit of a mix. Um, can clubs be held accountable if the player does attend training after after system? Um, I assume that every player and every club member that's involved would have signed a code of conduct and in that code of conduct of any sport, there would be the, um, the requirement or the recommendation that a player or an athlete's uh, welfare and well-being uh, and is of paramount concern or should be the uh, top priority. So yes, I think that clubs and people that make decisions within the club probably can be held accountable if something happens during training when you know they've sustained a concussion and it hasn't been managed appropriately. So you just need to be aware of that certainly. Uh, somebody asked, Wendy asking a question, do you feel there has been a good handle on concussion that AFL have a way to go from the media? Um, I think there's a mixed bag between what the media reports and what actually goes on and, and uh, a lot of the people that I've been, had the pleasure of being involved with and also been involved with in terms of colleagues who are looking after clubs are doing um, a good job and the best job they can. Uh, I think a lot of the governing bodies of the sports have done a really good job in terms of getting video um, sideline video evidence available from multiple angles so that the club doctors looking 100 metres across the field in an AFL game where the uh, middle of the pitch tends to go up a little bit, well, they can't necessarily see everything on the other side. But they can now go to the sideline, have a look at the video and make a decision based on that. So that's um, so that's that's important and I think we've forward in that regard over the last few years. through the rest of the question. A lot of questions about handouts, so we will make that available for you. Rugby seems to have a good handle on the AFL, have a way to go. If anybody feels like that I haven't answered a question that you've put in and you really want to hear the answer, just um, send it back through again now because I'm right down the bottom and I think that I probably have missed something, but I think that I've touched on most of that. Uh, okay, Hayden, um, do you think school students knowing the symptoms is a bad thing that they can be led by questioning when they receive a hit? Will, uh, they know the symptoms how to answer the questions rather than actually have the question. Yeah, that's, uh, to some extent that's correct and you might find that some athletes are like that. The other thing that we need to be careful of uh, when we're talking about kids is that we're really um, making sure we're careful of our language that we're using. So instead of saying, do you have a headache and the, and the kid, uh, potentially the kid says, yes, I do, and all they have is a graze on their forehead and that's the, the headache that they have, we need to be a little bit more um, specific and be asking 
do you do you feel like you have sort of big pressure in your head or a sore head or do you feel like any kind of words that imply discomfort or, or pain etc that they can understand uh, so that we're really getting to the nuts and bolts of the, the headache as in potential pressure potential uh, discomfort not just a little scratch or or, or a little bump that's happened to the head and it's just sore in the area. We took the bump and necessarily. Um, so we just need to be careful. Yep. So uh, Max, thank you very much for pointing that out. Yep, we have. Um, so rugby union, rugby league, and Australian rules football all have uh, information in terms of uh, medical paperwork that needs to be completed, um, and they're all available on the website. So, yeah. all right. Yeah, so if a player's had two or three knocks to the head but does not necessarily show any, I guess that's signs, symptoms, um, should they still allow them to play without medical advice? Um, that's, that's one of the trickiest decisions that you need to make. So um, if you feel like they have any, if you have any inkling or any suspicion that they have sustained any kind of concussion, um, then you need to be removed from the play. So it depends on how bad those two or three knocks are. If they look like they've taken the bump and they, they say they don't have any signs and you're watching them really, really closely and it looks like they don't have any signs, then potentially they haven't sustained a concussion. But if they've taken two or three blows to the head um, in a sport, depending on what the sport is as well, I guess, um, in, a, in, in a contact or collision sport, then you probably seriously need to think about whether they have, uh, whether they're telling you fibs or, or whether you really think you suspect a concussion may have occurred. You don't want to have a, a high threshold, so uh, if you do have any suspicion, then you're just removing that athlete from play and not allowing them to go back on the field. And then you refer them to the medical practitioner, a medical practitioner may say, oh, hang on a minute, you took them off and they, they didn't have a concussion, then they can go back to full contact training without going through a third body return to play. But if that medical practitioner then says, yes, they had a concussion, I'm diagnosing it, then they can go through the process. I hope that clarifies it, but that's one of the toughest questions and one of the hardest things to deal with. Uh, is there any role for the SCAD if there is no baseline assessment? Um, depends on who's using it. Again, I would clarify that. Uh, so we need to be very aware and careful of how uh, how we interpret the, the results. If we don't know what we're measuring or what we're looking at, then we probably shouldn't be using it. Um, as I said, it is a medical tool. Uh, it's not used for diagnostic purposes, but it is used to help make that diagnostic clinical decision. Um, but there again, how soon after possible concussion are they allowed to go to sleep? Um, well, that's uh, contingent upon a few things as well. Um, as long as somebody is monitoring them very, very closely, um, so arousing them, making sure that they tell you, they may tell you to go away, uh, but that's good because you know that there's, there's not something sinister going on. Um, it is good to probably keep them awake for a little while um, afterwards, so whether that be one to two hours. But again, if you've got a washout game and you're playing midweek and the athlete typically goes to bed at 8.30, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock and they've got their concussion around about that time, they're going to be potentially a little bit tired from the concussion but also tired because they've just played a, a physical activity uh, and they're also at their bedtime, they're going to be feeling reasonably tired. So you need to be just really monitoring them very, very closely. If there's any other red flags involved with that, you need to be taking them to the emergency department. So again, Although it sounds like a basic question, there's a lot of caveats to providing an answer for that one. But we really want to be making sure we're monitoring them closely. If they have fallen asleep, we're arousing them so that we know that they haven't lost consciousness, um, that there's something more sensitive. So making sure you're really looking up. Um,
players been diagnosed with five concussions in the season? Should they sit out? Um, very good question. Uh, some people might need to sit out before five concussions, and other people might get to their fifth concussion and still be doing okay. If that's uh, a good way of describing it. But I, I certainly think that they should be being um, more rigorously looked at after their second concussion. So if they sustain a concussion, um, their full recovery and they're okay. If it's a second concussion in the season, then in my personal opinion, they can go and see a GP and do things, but that GP potentially would be wanting to refer to a specialist, whether that be a neurologist or a surgeon. Um, if they want to do further cognitive testing, it might be a psychologist. If they have kind of vestibular problems, you might be going was an expert in vestibular areas. Uh, and so you want to, and you might have some neuroimaging as well. So you want to be really looking after that athlete um, a lot more uh, following their second or subsequent concussion than what you would um, after necessarily after their first. Now, we see um, a lot of people um, in the clinic who have had multiple concussions, and we are a lot more conservative with subsequent concussions than what we are with initial one. Um, so we've, we've managed a few people where we've sat them out for the rest of the season. We've managed a few people where we've, where we've sat them out for a month or two months, um, and then they've played. And I've also been involved in the management of players who have had multiple concussions during the career and had a few concussions during the season that I've seen them, um, and they've made the decision to retire completely from the sport. Um, so it's, it's always an individual eight on an individual basis. But if they've got to five concussions, I'd like to think that they've been well and truly looked after during their second, third, and fourth one, and that they're really looking after the fifth one. And it's highly likely if somebody came to me with a concussion and I hadn't seen them previously in the season, that, that they would be But again, individual differences. In the uh, biggest challenge is getting coaching staff to listen and then agree with the medical staff and sports trainers instead of their player. Exactly, that's precisely what goes on at every level of the game, not only at the grassroots level, but also right to the semi-professional, right up to the semi-professional level. Um, one of the things that I mentioned before that you can come back on, in my opinion, is that code of conduct. So coaches, um, trainers, even parents of, of young athletes um, would have signed a code of conduct on behalf of an athlete or the athlete themselves, um, or the coaches have. And so as part of that, you go and have a look at the code of conduct. Nearly every code of conduct in all of them would have something about the athlete's um, welfare being concern or the highest priority. And if somebody's making a decision that goes against what you've made as the, whether it be medical staff or first aid officer or the person that's involved in helping out on that day and you're that designated person and you've made a decision and people are not abiding by that decision, then certainly um, I think you can take the code of conduct to them and ask them to please explain. Uh, is there a limit on how many concussions a player can have in one season before they are stopped from playing the rest of the season? Um, I think I answered that question just a little bit before, uh, so I won't go back over it. But yeah, there is a certain, uh, again, it's an individualised basis, but there is a certain uh, threshold that I wouldn't like to go to. Uh, a player's parent mentioned that their son had sustained nine to ten concussions in his career. This was a player in his 20s, doesn't display any real signs, uh, sorry, symptoms normally. The question is how many concussions can someone sustain continuing the sport? Again, um, I'd be wanting to make sure that athlete is really um, strongly assessed. We saw somebody in our clinic um, this week just gone who is in his early 20s and has had 12 concussions. Uh, large majority of them are during sport, but he's also had some outside of sport. And so uh, really needing to check if it's a tackling technique issue or, or a contact technique issue, it depends on um, and we also need to check if they are getting more vulnerable to smaller knocks. So, I mean, if a, if a knock with a less impactive force is causing them to be symptomatic, then that's, there's an indication that they're becoming more vulnerable. If they're taking a lot longer to recover from their subsequent concussions, then it shows that they are a little more vulnerable as well. And so all of these things are into consideration. But nine or ten concussions before you're 20, that's, that's a lot, and um, I'd certainly be thoroughly investigating. about sports physicians. Um, I'm not sure what that question is in reference to, but if you're talking about using SCAT, then yes, absolutely, for practitioners. Um, sports physicians can look after 
fashion they can look after everything. Um, so um, you, Rob, if you just want to rewrite what specifically you can about the sports conditions, then I can talk to that I've just answered your question. Uh, okay, so if a player has sustained multiple concussions from very minor tackles not recognised at the time, would they undergo imaging or further assessment to check wars? Uh, potentially, um, but again, it'd be a case by case. Uh, so, um, I think with regards to the slides, Sports Medicine Australia should have everybody's email address that you use to log in, and I can put the slides into a PDF and send them to everybody who's attended or, or signed up. So, that's no problem. Um, looks like the Yes, that's right. Yep, um, I totally agree, Rob. Uh, no, no, no problems from me. Uh, the only problem is that they're they're not available everywhere. Um, so yes, they do a fantastic job, and yes, they are in a better position. And absolutely, I would encourage people to go seek them out. Uh, but in some country towns, some people may be on the more isolated or rural settings. Um, they're few and far between. So. But certainly, yes, sports physicians, great, um, great group of people who are more than qualified to, to look after this. All right, well, um, I think we might draw it to a close. Um, if, uh, if anybody has any pressing questions, just quickly write them in now. Um, otherwise, thank you everybody for, uh, for joining. And if you have any questions, you can always look up my um, email address on the Newcastle University website I'm uh, to you, with you by uh, email. So thanks for your time, really appreciate it and um, have a good evening.